This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers and scholars, or just people of ideas of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. My guest today is a professor of music psychology at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev here in Israel and the author of a new book entitled Driving with Music, Cognitive Behavioral Implications that was recently published in English by Ashgate. He's now joining me here in the studio. Professor Warren Brodsky, welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Good morning. Uh, so the title of your book, to me at least, seems almost contradictory, I would think. that driving with music has or should have no implications whatsoever because it's just white noise. It's something that we all do while spending many long hours at the wheel. Okay, well, it's true that we all do, and we spend many hours at the wheel listening to music, but that doesn't mean that it's totally just beneficial. But yes. What we do know from research is it presents many risks and hazards, levels of distraction to the driver, which sometimes could be fatal. Mm-hmm. What kind of distraction are we, are we talking about? Because they're still keeping their eyes on the road and driving is something that you, know, you need to be fully concentrated all the time. But it's something that you kind of do on autopilot as well. Okay, well, let's separate between what was traditionally thought. in the past, before my research, um, about listening to music. Most driving research has traditionally looked at music, quote-unquote, as a mechanical, structural activity, turning on the radio, swapping between tapes or CDs, or now it would be thumbing through, scrolling through an MP3 playlist or something like that. So before my research, no one has ever looked at the actual tones, the music, the sounds themselves that drivers listen to. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, the structural mechanical interference has always been seen to be difficult and distracting. You do take your eyes off the road for more than two seconds to change a channel or to, mm-hmm. or, or to push a button down. You know, for, for uh, I want more tone, bass, I want it in the front, the back. You know, when you're, you're looking at selectors or just swapping CDs, <laughs> looking down to find the right CD, get it out of the box, put it in. Mm-hmm. So from that point of view, um, your assumption that it's all automatic is not 100%. Right. We, we all do other things. And they could be anything from looking in the rear of a mirror, or ch- checking out your phone rang, who called, or so on and so forth. These are all or just, just talking on the phone. Talking on the phone. Even if it is uh, research that has come out, is talking on the phone is, is also very distracting. It's mm. not just a matter of I'm holding it because hands-free, but it's the content. And when you get to the content of conversation, it could be emotional, emotionally distracting. And that would lead us to the question of, Okay, let's just say that we have voice activated infotainment systems, then we can just put on our MP3 player or uh, a satellite channel. So then what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that the songs we listen to, the music we listen to, is very distracting because of the content of the mm-hmm. music in the same way a conversation, even if we're not touching the phone, we're just conversing. And, and, and how, does it, how does it work, really, cognitively, the fact that we listen to music and it changes something in us in the way we... Okay, listen. well, let's, before we say changes, let's just say that we all have mental resources and sometimes we're maxed out. What we're doing, the, our performance, the vehicle that we have to control, requires a certain amount of attention. And it could be that I'm listening to music and my attention isn't there. I remember that song from high school or that was a piece from, you know, when I, that takes me back to my first girlfriend or, or I'm listening to a piece of jazz and what a bass player and I'm listening to these lines or, if, you know, it could be classical music and say, oh, my God, what a modulation. I never expected him to take that tonality to there. And all of a sudden you realize that your mind really is on the road. 
Mm-hmm. So it's not just a matter of emotional, what does it do to me? It gets me upset, angry, or passionate, or some, something else, but it actually takes up your mental resources. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it can be dangerous. And therefore, it can be distracting, and distracting can be d- dangerous, right? Mm-hmm. So even if you say, well, can I listen to a piece that I know so well I don't pay attention to it? Well, then there's memory retraces. Where did I hear it first? Who was I with? What was I doing? And if it's new pieces, which is probably better, if you're involved in listening to the music, you know, the voicing or how the person was playing, you know, like – so it, that, that also takes up a lot of your resources. What takes, more, takes up more resources, uh, going back to a well-known piece or listening to new, a new piece of music? Okay, what you're really saying then is there must be something more in the music than just that, okay? And what we know about music in general is there's something called complexity. Music could be very simple, transparent. Mm-hmm. It could be something that, that has a level of redundancy that you really don't think about it. Or it could be something very complex, Okay, Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of how many instruments are there, but it's what they're doing, if you understand what I'm saying. So, for example, you might choose a piece of music if you'd like to fall asleep and you say, it's so busy, it is so complex, it is so interesting, it is so new and novel that keeps my mind on it, as opposed to trying to choose music that would just allow me to have a relaxing and be able to break away from it, to be able to flow with it, if you want. Think about music as being something functional in life. So... If you had to eat and you were choosing music that would be in the background for a meal, then you might choose a certain kind of music. And if you wanted that meal to be particularly romantic, you might choose a different kind of music. Mm -hmm. I would probably say the only place in our everyday life that we really don't have the awareness that we have to choose the music is when we drive. Now, that's really unfortunate because research from the beginning of the millennium shows that the place that we listen to music the most – is in the car. Yeah. People aren't really sitting in their living room anymore with friends and and in, in, intimate friends or relatives or whatever and sitting around and listening to you know a symphony or or a great piece of jazz or whatever it is. I'm not saying people don't, but that's not the place we but usually Maybe it's because we experience music differently. That's uh, right. Yeah, I mean it, it, people listen to to music in the cars or mainly in the cars because it's a monotonous boring task that we have to do every day for um, sometimes many hours and it's something we need some kind of distraction for so you know from so so maybe maybe this distraction is what really we hang on to okay well what R- you, rather than engage with the music do you see what well, i mean okay well first of all we do engage in the music i would say probably about 70 to 80% of the people sing to the music mm-hmm. okay it's sort of like uh, a karaoke like type you know, experience, and I call it karaoke with a C, like mm-hmm. car. Okay, we do play with the music. We're always tap something. Many of us are tapping on the steering wheel or on our, our knees or our feet or, you know, tapping out the beats and this and that. And there are people that will hold an imaginary microphone as if they're singing or yeah. play air guitar, you know, do fingering or this and that and the next thing. And there are people that will dance in the seat. Uh-huh. So, so you become a performer. I mean, the car, is, as a metaphor, is like a stage. You put all music, and nowadays cars are built for acoustic properties. So you have speakers in the front, back, sides. You have surround sound. You have you know, woofers and bass speakers and all kinds of you know, acoustically treated environment. It's a bubble in a sense. It's like being in a little you know, recording studio where yeah. you can do what you want and close the windows, and you can be you know, a singer of a band, or you could be the... The, the backup singers and do all the fills and the runs, you know, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So the car really is an important place for mobile music, not mobile because it's in the car mobile, but it's mobile because we take our music with us. Yeah. And I think the real issue is, is that we really don't consider and we're not aware of how one has to choose music differentially. Like I said, if you, if you went to a gym – you would take music that you want to walk on the treadmill to. And if you were out running, you would choose that, a certain kind of music. Yeah. And if you were planning an event like a wedding, you would tell the DJ, this is the kind of music I want because I want people to dance. Mm-hmm. So it's not so far-fetched to say you have to choose music depending on the activity you're doing and the place it's going to be. And we just don't think about it. The car isn't a dance floor. The mm-hmm. car isn't a bar. 
But do, do we all really experience music in the same way? Because when you talk about the complexity of the piece and the tonality and the arrangement and the instruments and the orchestration, you have to have some kind of knack for music to appreciate that and engage with the music in, in this kind of way. Is it something that we, we all do across the board, no matter how musically oriented we are? Yeah, you're asking a complicated question, and the answer is yes and no. So uh -huh. first of all, let me tell you why no. No, we don't all act the same way because we do have certain preferences. We do have certain types of experiences, personality types. We are different kinds of listeners. Some are sensorial listeners and they listen more for the, the sensation that's coming out of it. And there are other people that, that listen for intellectual properties and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, based on well, What do you mean by intellectual property in this sense? Well, there's some people that will listen to music from a more intellectual point of view. They listen to the, the keys that it goes to, the kind of counterpoint that's there. Uh, the, mm. There are other people that just say, I listen and either I like it or I don't. They, don't, they, they won't move on to a different level because that's where they are. It's not because they don't necessarily know, but you know, um, I don't know very much about wine. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not a connoisseur of wine. I either like it or I don't. Yeah. But you'd ask somebody else that's a connoisseur of wine, and they would give you all kinds of metaphors. Oh, it tingles like this, or it does that, or I feel an aftertaste. And maybe the same thing. You know, I I drink a lot of coffee, but I really don't know much about coffee. So, mm -hmm. so I could go into you know a coffee bar in the states where you have like 150 types of coffee, and I'll just say to the lady that's serving them, what do you like? Give me what you like because you must know you work here. So it's not because I can't learn about it or this and that, but from, from that point of view, it's either I like it or I don't. The same thing is about music. There are some people that just say, I like the way it sounds. It does something for me. And that's the level they're on. And I'm not saying that in a condescending way. I'm just saying we are different types of listeners in the same ways that we have different personalities. Some people are more introverted. Some people are more extroverted. And we know that different kinds of music or they're more open to new experiences and there are some people that are less open to new experiences so they might like certain kind of musics that are more at vanguard or not. So your answer is no to your question that no, we don't all react the same way. Mm -hmm. But we as a human species do all have a very similar form of perception and we do have a very similar way that our bodies react to sensations. And so my first piece of research in this field that was published in 2002, so we're going back a long time, mm. was the first piece to demonstrate that the faster the tempo of the music, the faster we drive. Uh -huh. And it's a piece of research that is cited by anyone that deals with sound or something like that in the car. And although it was done in Israel, in Ben Gurion University, in, a, in, in the desert, yeah. with a very small number of students, it was very it had a very big impact, the way we did it, and so on and so forth. And it didn't matter if you were a male or a female, or if you were younger or older, within the age group that we studied. Mm -hmm. um, and people have tried to replicate it, and they show that it, that it does work. So in other words, there are certain things that no matter who we are, we do the same, mm -hmm. okay? And we react to, to volume within the Western world, obviously. I can't talk about people that don't have a Western ear. Within the Western world, we relate to certain types of sounds as being happy or certain types of sounds as being sad, certain types of rhythmic patterns as being fast and slow or, or, or mm -hmm. forceful or, or something like that. It's a cultural thing, and it has nothing to do with what kind of a listener you are. Mm -hmm. So, so as opposed to the person itself, uh, we go back to the uh, to the kind of music, and therefore, would you say that there's any type of music, a genre, that is more dangerous in inverted commas than than others because they are louder, they are you know more rhythmic? So, let me ask you: Is there a type of food that is that is less healthy than other food? Probably, yeah. No, it's what's in the food. Okay, so in other words, you can't say Italian food oh, you or mean German kind of food. cuisine. Yeah, yeah, yeah but fatty yeah. food is obviously more right. more so, dangerous. So, so what you're really saying is mm. Italian or German or French or American or whatever it would be, okay, would be the same thing. It depends what's in the food. Yeah. So the same that, that answers your question. It's not the music genre. Is it classical pop, jazz, or something like that? But it's what's in it. What are the musical elements that are in it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I already mentioned in the past tempo. Yeah. So you could take a piece by Vivaldi, you know, if it's really, really fast, like one of the Four Seasons, yeah. that might have the same effect as a piece of music of speed metal or something like mm -hmm. that. Okay, 
speed metal has other elements that Vivaldi doesn't. But if you're just looking at tempo, that might not be a great piece to listen to. Mm-hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, one of the pieces that has been suggested over the years, this isn't my finding, but it's in, in you know, all over the internet, that the most dangerous piece you can listen to is a piece of Wagner. Uh-huh. And it has not because of Wagner's Wagner, you know, which has, you know, these undertones of the Holocaust and yeah. that, but because the piece is very aggressive. Uh-huh. But I don't think that's the worst piece, but I'm just saying. Has, has your research taken any applied or applicable turn? Do the police, are they aware of, of, of the dangers of uh, listening to music while driving and other, you know, agencies that are dealing with road safety? Okay, so first of all, let me just say, since this is TLV1, which takes place in Israel, let me give credit that Israel is the only country in the world that has put any money from state funding into studying the effects of music on driving. Very so, interesting. So when I go to other conferences in other places of the world, at first people sort of snicker as, you know, this is sort of very something on the periphery. And then when they hear and they read the acknowledgments that, you know, the Israel National Safety, Road Safety Authority has actually put money into research in this area, they're like, we must be like 10 or 15 years ahead of them already Uh as far as demonstrating certain types of things. So that's one thing. The second thing is the applications. After that first study that I did in 2002 came out, which obviously was done like three years before that, it takes time till something actually you know mm-hmm. gets published. Although people were listening to this at conference presentations before, and I was getting comments of people from various parts of the world. But when it first came out, a lot of people were really interested, okay, if you've learned that, then what is the best music for listen us to, to listen to? Mm-hmm. And it was very clear that, as I said before, there isn't a genre. People wanted to know, is Beatles music better than... Black Sabbath and a lot of the, the, the you know, Radio 7 were, were interested in, you know, like is uh, Hasidic music actually better than secular music? Everybody had a political agenda in yeah. a sense and they were trying to utilize this kind of study. I was getting calls from the magistrates in, in London. Could they – could they uh, claim that someone that did uh, you know, that that was in a crash and he was listening to heavy metal music that he was negligent? Everybody was yeah, every, seriously. Yeah, everybody has some kind of an agenda rather than try to understand the concept behind it. Um, but your question about the application was: uh, in a previous life of mine, I was a music therapist, so I was a clinician for a long time, and before that, I was a performing musician. Mm-hmm. But those two um, aspects of my life gave me a deep appreciation of the effects of music and how music can be manipulated to change behavior. So it was very, if you will, interesting and exciting to think about, could we actually produce a piece of music or a program of music that might be safer? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've done this with an Israeli composer whose name is Micha Kisner, and I published an article about how we developed this music. And so your answer as far as application goes is yes. Uh You can take the various findings of sterile research and apply them with a music composer who you can teach what kind of elements you need and why and so on and so forth. They can compose music accordingly, and you can then test it to validate it. Does it work? That's what the Israel uh, National Road Safety Authority did. Mm. Um, we had studied for two years groups of young nov- novice drivers in between high school and army age, which is the only age group that we could get our hands on before the army. You can't touch uh, yeah. in Israel people once again in the army. But also that's the age group that has the highest level of fatalities on the road everywhere in the world. So, yeah. so we were interested in might we be able to highlight one of those variables. And we had 85 young novice drivers that we didn't recruit. They were recruited, if you will, randomly in, mm-hmm. in areas of central Israel. Um, drive six times, twice without music, twice with music they rang from the home. In other words, their most favorite driving tracks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then twice with the music that we produced. Let's call it the experimental background music. And what we found is, is that the music that young novice drivers bring from the home increases the risk factor by about 120%. That's a lot. Yeah. And the music that we gave them decreases the risk factor by 40%. Mm-hmm. So, and when you say increases or decreases, it's compared to baseline of no music. Right. So if they brought music from their home, 
and they're having a good time. I mean, on questionnaires of uh, affect and mood and this and that, they're having a good time. What, what kind of music would you give them to decrease the uh, risk factor? Oh, the music that, that, that we use. Um, you might call it elevator music. You mm-hmm. might call it oral wallpaper. I mean, you know, there's something that is in the background that you're mm-hmm. almost not even aware of that's there. The, the purpose is to keep up a certain level of emotion to be able to not take away the cognitive mental resources that are required um, and to provide a certain tempo that will continually allow you to do the task. Which is what you listen to when you drive? Not all the time. Mm-hmm. I have driven with the music that we created thousands of hours. And there is an element of behavioral modification that the minute you put it on, because you know it's supposed to be safe, yeah. in a sense, you know, you're safer. Yeah. Um, but I can't, I can't even remember what track it is. In other mm-hmm. words, it's sort of there and you're not really paying attention to it. Yeah. Well, thankfully, people don't listen to music on the road anymore. They listen to TLV One podcast. So uh, <laughs> the problem there is solved. Uh, uh, professor Warren Brodsky, uh, you're a professor of uh, music psychology at Ben Gurion University and uh, the author of uh, Driving with Music, Cognitive Behavioral Implications, a uh, recently uh, published uh, book. Thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. That brings us to the end of our show today. Thank you very much for listening. Also, big thanks to Alex Benish, the technical producer of this show. I'm Gilad Halpern, signing off here in Tel Aviv. Do join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. It seems like every story told about us is meant to be. We fly winds ago all the way back. Follow